So, all right, I'm going to turn on my video just quickly so you can see who your instructor is today. Uh, for a lot of you all that joined last week, welcome back. Um, and for new folks, I'm glad you're able to join us today on what looks to be a very, well, it is a cold, a cold, snowy day in Northern Illinois. Um, I'm Grant McCarty. I'm a local foods and small farms educator uh, that serves Joe Davis, Stevenson, and Winnebago counties up here in Northern Illinois. Um, and as part of our Fruits on Friday series, uh, our second fruit to cover is stone fruit, along with some other uh, special guests, if you will, in the fruit category. When we think about especially tree fruit, we have the apples and the pears group, and then the other group that we tend to sometimes recommend for folks to grow is stone fruit. Those other kind of peaches, plums, cherries, and others that can work okay in some years, as I think maybe some of you all have figured out if you have planted them, or if you're starting to think about planting them, you might have some hesitation here with them too. And yet it is one that we will sometimes recommend in the extension office that, you know, try it and, and see how it works for you. So today's plant is going to get a lot into stone fruit. You know, as you kind of saw with last week's um, for apples and pears, we'll get into some general practices and production. I'll cover pruning just a little bit, although we have a much more extensive pruning class um, that's delivered via Zoom that can go into more detail on that. We'll get into some pest management. We are also going to um, uh, get into the harvest period as well. But a lot of what we talk about in stone fruit, we'll really be talking about, okay, what are the best cultivars to grow for our area? And what are some issues that you might encounter? The other section of today is kind of the uncommon or the other ones. This does include tree fruits like say pawpaw or some of those newer berries like aronia or goji berry, kiwi fruit. I've also thrown in nuts, uh, you know, growing almonds, hazelnuts. Some of those could potentially grow really well in our area. Um, depending on kind of what you what your expectations are when it comes to growing them. So that's what I've tried to do in that other group is try to address some of the ones that we commonly get questions about and what are some things that you might need to consider when it comes to growing uh, those groups. When it comes to stone fruit, and especially for stone fruit in northern Illinois, think of this slide as a scale. You know, if you were thinking that you want to put stone fruit and plant stone fruit trees out, I would say the most reliable ones are going to be the plums as well as the tart and the cherry, sour cherries. So you have folks that say tart cherries, they grow sour cherries, they grow pie cherries, all three tend to mean the same thing. But these two are, are really good when it comes to growing and yielding well for you. And they're very consistent in their yields. And we'll discuss today kind of why, why that is. This next group is kind of every other year or so. You know, peaches, apricots, and nectarines, these can all grow well in some years. Uh, it could be that you expect to get yields one year, and then maybe you don't get yields for a couple of seasons to come. Um, th that's just the way they are. We, you know, you could still find some success with them, but you should expect yields to not, to not occur all the time. For example, um, we have two peach trees at the Rockford office. We have had wonderful fruit on those peach trees in 2019. We had no fruit in 2020 due to environmental and weather and other things. The least reliable is sweet cherries, and we'll go into why this is. But this is one where there are some varieties that might work for you, but a lot of the ones that people really love and, and want to grow tend to just not grow well in, in our growing area. From that perspective, a lot of times we say, certainly, you know, if someone calls our extension office on a backyard scale, plant a fruit tree of this group, see how it goes for you, plant a couple, because maybe you need a couple for it to yield. But if someone's to call our extension office and to say, you know, I want to put out um, 40 peach trees in our orchard, um, we would not recommend that because they're just very inconsistent. And you would probably notice this too if you visited any of our orchards in Northern Illinois. In fact, I was at one of the orchards in the Rockford area last week and among close to a thousand apple trees that he has out there, he has four plum trees. And that kind of tells you everything there is right there that out of a thousand apple trees he has, the opposite end is he has four plum trees. 
So we just don't recommend commercial production. Backyard, I say go for it. And I myself am doing this as well from a backyard perspective. So what are the challenge then? You know, it's, it's weird to start negative about this group and yet you have to be pretty black and white when it comes to growing stone fruit. There's a lot of impact of weather here, just where we're at in this zone 5A, 5B, which most of us reside. Some parts we might be in the 4B, even in parts of Joe Davis County. Um, the impact of weather just ha has an impact. Um, <laughs> very, very cold winters into those negative temperatures, especially once you start to get negative eight degrees Fahrenheit. And certainly that year where we were getting close to negative 25, negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit killed some of our stone fruit and severely impacted that stone fruit tree. Not only is it the weather winter, the winter weather that does this, it's also the spring. It is that cold spring that's wet that lingers and impacts the flowers of the stone fruit family. So it's that kind of one, two punch. It's that, okay, we've had a mild winter now, and yet springtime when these start to flower, we could have a, um, a longer period of coldness that impacts them. This yields to your regular yields really. It really is going to impact that you don't have consistent yields every single season. And yet again, some stone, for stone fruit is, is, is good with this. This group still has diseases and insects, so you're still going to encounter both of them, which we'll talk about today. The other thing that we encounter with our planting zone is that there are few varieties available to grow. And when you look through nurseries, online catalogs, you'll find that you may just have three choices when it comes to growing a peach tree compared to say apples and pears, where sometimes you have maybe 15 to 20 different types of pears you could grow. Gosh, sometimes up to 40, 50 different types of apples, if not more. You also may be limited choice on tree height. So you found the peach that you want to grow and yet the only peach height that you can get a standard perhaps. Um, this is a group that it would also be more of a balanced pruning needs. And we'll talk a little bit about that to go in, going forward. And another issue is that they may need more than one cultivar. So not only will they, you know, you've planted two of these trees and you needed to plant two trees, both of those trees have to survive the winter and their buds have to survive a late spring frost. And that's another challenge that you encounter with them. So it sounds like some challenges and yet let's talk about opportunities. There's good things with this group. You know, When they yield, they yield really well. You're gonna find that when you talk to people that maybe have stone fruit, some of them really say, ah, I had you know, a bountiful harvest in 2018 or a bountiful harvest in 2019. You know, they're very good years. We still talk a lot about our yields of peaches at our Rockford office and just, you know, harvesting what felt like buckets and bucks of buckets of peaches to bring to the food pantries in the Rockford community. So you can have good years in here. You'll also find a lot of suitable varieties to grow. And not only that, you know, there are suitable varieties, there's also newer cultivars being developed from Wisconsin and University of Minnesota. Both of them are really trying to find some of those plums, peaches, and other stone fruit that can survive very cold planting zones, sometimes into zone three, sometimes into zone four. So it's possible that you're finding them. Of course, you'll also find dwarf and bush types available to you as well. So that's always great. And then I think one of the other opportunities here is that they are able to yield with sometimes one tree. If you only have space for one tree, you may find certain cultivars of the stone fruit family where you just need one and you're gonna get fruit. And I think that's one of the great benefits with this group is that yes, there are some challenges here. And yet, if you've got space for one tree, you may, depending on that cultivar and variety, be able just to plant one and get away with it. So when thinking about cultivars then, you know, certainly be aware of your planting zone limitations. Uh, where I am at, I'm planting zone 5A, you're probably planting zone 5B, you might even be creeping into planting zone 4. And it's very mindful to be cautious of that and recognize that limitation here. Um, you may be in a different planting zone and we have some folks from other parts of the state and that may open you up to other opportunities. As you're looking through catalogs and websites and you see that this cultivar is perhaps listed for planting zone 5, 
just be a little mindful of that. You know, that's basically saying that that is the minimum kind of range for that cultivar. And it may mean that the really cold winters really impact it. Compare that to maybe some of the cultivars out there that are listed at planting zone four, where, okay, you're putting a planting zone four cultivar into your planting zone five backyard, you should have some really good success there. We always recommend ordering from reputable nurseries and greenhouse. Always know if you need more than one cultivar. I would also recommend if you need more than one of these cultivars, plan to plant them in the same year. I think that that just helps you quite a bit when it comes to the maturity of these fruit trees is to plant them in the same year if you can, especially if they need more than one. I also encourage you to think more critically about a dwarf and a semi-dwarf tree. Um, you see listed here that dwarf tree of eight to 10 feet, semi-dwarf about 12 to 16 feet, and standard 25 feet. This is all what their kind of mature height would be. A basic rule of thumb is that you would space these then uh, based on their expected height. So if it's a dwarf tree, I would probably space them from trunk to trunk at about 10 feet. Standard, of course, you might be able to get away with 20 feet between trees, depending on, on it. Um, as well, you know, as I kind of talk with you, you'll make them apart, but not the entire backyard orchard. So if you're planning to put out maybe 10 or 15 different fruit trees in your backyard, you know, consider the stone fruit, but maybe don't plant 10 to 15 of just stone fruit. Put in some apples, some pears, maybe some other uncommon, unusual fruit trees and make them a part of it. You know, right now I've got two peach trees in my backyard orchard, uh, negotiating with the family as to what else I can plant at this time. So I'm going to introduce each of these stone fruit you're gonna see some different cultivars that are recommended from U of I Extension. And I've tried to also include some additional information of uh, some things that you might have to look out for. Um, peach, for instance, you know, these are, there's very few available. The three you see listed here are, are it. <laughs> uh, you know, we wish we had more options. Some folks have had success with Alberta. Alberta is not listed here. And yet when it comes to what we might recommend, you know, we still are kind of talking about Contender, Reliance, and Madison. These are all three that are very regularly more available to you. Um, one of the ones like Contender, you can see it's listed as a zone four to eight, which is really good, um, especially if you're in a, a area where you feel like it maybe have a later frost or it stays colder, Contender might be a, a better, better one for you, if you will. Um, it is one that also blooms much later. And so perhaps it could escape any kind of lingering late spring frost that we might encounter. It is also important to realize with peaches that they are all self-pollinating. So you do not need more than one peach tree in order to get your peaches. We sometimes will state, you know, if you plant an additional peach tree, you might get more fruit. That's just one thing we note, but you can get away with just one peach tree. Reliance is one that has been listed that has a lot of ability to withstand negative temperatures more often, or the most often when you compare it to Contender or Madison. Uh, both Contender and Reliance are two that we have at our Rockford office. I also just planted Contender and Reliance as dwarf trees in my backyard. I haven't had a lot of, uh, I'm unaware of Madison, though it is one that is a late peach. It is one, this Madison one, you, because it's a late peach, there's probably a strong chance it's also a late bloomer when it comes to flowering. And so Madison might be one to consider um, to kind of get out of that, that spring, spring, um, spring late frost. But all three you see listed here are recommended for our area and a lot of folks have really good success with them. For apricots and nectarines, you're gonna need more than one cross, one for cross pollination. So as we've talked about with apples and pears, where you need more than one variety flowering at the same time, it's same for apricots and nectarines. You need more than one for cross pollination. Um, one of the things that has been noted, especially for this group is that they're very hardy. There's a very good, chance that these are going to be able to really withstand a lot of the weather that we that we encounter. Um, there's also kind of a group of cultivars that start with HAR. So you may see that at nurseries and home centers, this kind of HAR 
hardy red nectarine is one that has been mentioned. Uh, both moon gold, sun gold are two of the most common ones. They, it, what is nice is that both of these can act as a pollinator with each other, and both of them also have a very different flavor. And I think that's a nice draw that you just are not getting the same flavor of your apricots. You could plant moon gold, you could plant sun gold, both of them would help with each other to cross pollinate and produce apricots, and yet both of them would have a different flavor. If you just had space for one type of apricot though, you could plant gold cot, you could plant Chinese, and both of these are self fruitful. So you're not going to need an additional apricot for, um, for pollination. Both of them just planting either gold cot or Chinese is going to produce the nectar, or rather the apricots for you. If you recall that first slide about kind of the scale of reliability for stone fruit, plums tends to be straight at the top. And the reason for this is their flowering. They're gonna be a much later flower period, um, but they also are still gonna yield very consistently for you. They have a wide range of colors, a wide range of flavors, and you're gonna find just a greater amount of choices for plums compared to potentially some of the other stone fruit that we talk about today. Um, some even start at zone three, black ice, which is based out of Wisconsin, a Wisconsin type, uh, Juanetta, Toka, Pipestone. Uh, Pipestone is one that's been recommended for drier areas. So maybe you have an area that just stays pretty dry. Pipestone could particularly work for you. Of the ones that are out there that no cross pollination is needed, Mount Royal would be the one. These other ones are ones that you would need to have some cross pollination. So you could plant a, a Toka, you could plant a Juanetta. Both of them would act as cross pollination for each other. And really, Toka is one that's just commonly recommended for performance as well as just really good flavor. There's a couple of other ones there, La Crescent Superior. Um, Pembina, which are mentioned. You also see commonly Stanley. Um, there's a little bit of concern with Stanley because it has a fair hardiness. I think that if you were in a planting zone that you felt was stays much colder than other, other parts, I would be cautious of Stanley. I would probably lean towards one of the other ones like Black Ice or Pipestone or even Mount Royal. Stanley can be a little inconsistent when it comes to cold hardiness in surviving those winters. Your tart, sour, pie cherries, they're gonna be very reliable in yields. You know, most seasons you're gonna find yields for this group. Uh, they are very consistent in yields. They're, don't always tend to be too fussy. Um, and because this group does not need more than one variety, I think there's a lot of benefit here. We have a sour cherry tree at the Rockford office that is very consistent, and yet we just have one sour cherry tree, and it yields pretty well most seasons uh, for us. There's a lot of very traditional cultivars, Mount Morency, Danube, uh, the North Star and Meteor. Both North Star and Meteor are zone four. Um, all tend to have very, a little bit of a similar flavor when it comes to their use. And yet this is one where, you know, you're gonna find consistent yields for this group of tart sour cherries and you just need one of these trees to get cherries. And so that could be a, a nice draw for you. Within the same group of say the sour tart cherries that are producing an actual tree, you're also gonna find a bush type cherry. And this bush type of cherry um, we've seen a lot of folks try out because sometimes you actually find it at home and garden centers in the landscape section where it's a beautiful flowering bush and it's also producing tart cherries that you can harvest from. It is one that will get about eight to 10 feet tall, but it is gonna have a pretty wide spread. Sometimes about 10 to 15 feet spread is really what this bush um, is creating. One of the things that's interesting about this one is that it has very good winter hardiness. You know, they you see that it has considerable winter hardiness into very cold climates, zone zone three and, and much further. Two cultivars you'll see a lot of is the Nanking. Nanking is a very common bush cherry tree, or rather bush cherry. Uh, Hansen's is another one that you'll see pretty often. I think as well, like the other tart cherries, you just need one variety. 
Now the drawback with bush, the bush cherry, the birds love it. The birds love this cherry. We'll talk a little bit about today with um, bird control too. I'll mention that at the end today, um, kind of trying to keep birds and other things away from them. So what about sweet cherries then? You know, I we get calls at our extension office about sweet cherries and planting sweet cherries. And it is still one that you may have some okay luck with, but it's one that's very inconsistent. And the reason for this is that it blooms so early. It's one of the earliest flowering um, stone fruits that, that when you compare to the other stone fruits. So it's going to, um, it flowers and we still have a risk of snow. We still have a risk of a really late frost. And you also need more than one variety too. So that combination really, in most cases, really hurts sweet cherry production. Um, most of these are also zone five, so we don't even really see too many that are zone four or zone three. These are right on the cusp of zone five um, with it. There are occasionally some that do not need cross-pollination, so Benton, Lapins. Lapins is one that's similar to Bing Cherry, which would be one we would recommend if you're, if you're thinking about this. Um, there's also Black Gold, White Gold that can, that can work potentially depending on that season. Um, both black gold and white gold need, um, they need cross-pollination to occur. So you would need to plant black gold, you would need to plant white gold in order to get yields from black gold and yields from white gold. What about additional ones? Um, you know, a lot of folks have asked before about Rainier, cherries, and some of those others. And frankly, you still just have to factor in where you're planting. You know, the planting zone 5B just means that sometimes you're going to have good yields and sometimes you're not. And it is also challenging because you have both of, you will most likely need more than one variety and they will both need to survive winter and to survive spring in order to yield for both. It means that if black gold survived winter and spring, but white gold did not survive either of them, black gold is not going to produce sweet cherries for you. Um, there are none, none that I am aware of where you could plant a tart cherry and it provide the pollination needs for a sweet cherry. I'm unaware of that uh, at the market because that ideally would be a great thing and yet that's not it. So recognize the risk here with sweet cherries. That's really why we, we don't tend to recommend them too much because of the issue, but certainly um, know that there are maybe ones on the market that no cross pollination is needed and you just kind of cross your fingers and hope for a, uh, uh, a light spring. When you're looking through and deciding on different stone fruits, you're going to see rootstocks. And sometimes you're given a choice with this, you know, just as you are with apples and pears, and sometimes you're not. But the rootstock is going to provide kind of the different hardiness or different quality below ground compared to above ground. Uh, the fruit quality, uh, fruit and quality are the same no matter the rootstock. And this graft union, which you see here that I'm pointing at, um, has to be above the soil line or else the rootstock will really take over here. For stone fruit, you know, especially some of the companies that we might recommend you order from, like Junk Seeds or Stark Brothers, you may not be given much of a choice as to what the rootstock is that you want. And in most cases, this rootstock is providing that winter hardiness and the height. So it's giving that dwarf, that semi-dwarf, that standard height that you're expecting. And it's also providing a lot of winter hardiness for this group. That's really what we, we see with the stone fruit group. One of the main things that we don't actually see is disease resistance. So as we have talked about apples and pears, where this rootstock is providing disease resistance, sometimes we really don't see that with the stone fruit group. There's no disease resistance really being provided by that rootstock. It is mostly height and it is mostly winter hardiness. You may find occasionally as you're looking for sweet cherries, these two different rootstocks. There's Mazard, which would deliver a standard cherry tree, and there's Giselle, which would be a dwarf tree. And I mentioned both of these rootstocks because both of them are recommended or at least um, ones that may work for our planting zone five. So if you were going online and looking through catalogs and you really wanted to plant a Bing cherry tree, you might try to find a company that has the Mazard or the Giselle rootstocks. 
And both of those should provide winter hardiness. And they may also then provide, of course, the standard or the dwarf uh, height to it as well. But you know, that's just something to kind of keep in mind that those rootstocks might be available to you to actually choose, and that would be a great benefit with it. Otherwise, you don't see that that's going to um, that choice will be given to you necessarily. So some other decisions to look at is going to be the whip or the bare root or the feather. And this whip bare root is very readily available. It's easy to find uh, when you order from companies, they're going to be able to provide you with usually a whip or a bare root. It looks like a twig. There's no limbs that have been created yet. Um, it does tend to need more training or pruning and it will also delay bearing by a year. Whip bare root is usually less expensive. Uh, so sometimes you are saving money, but the benefit though, um, but the, the lacking then is that you don't get yields as soon. The feather does the opposite. So with feathered trees, which you see in this photo, the feathered tree arrives and it already has some limbs to it. This is one of my feathered peach trees that arrived this past spring. And so I already have limbs. It usually is gonna yield one year earlier. There's usually less training required, but it can just be harder to get sometimes. And you really may not be given much of a choice here. You know, I think that's one of the problems with the stone fruit is that there's so few varieties available to you that we would recommend you growing. And then when it comes to that next decision of deciding, you know, root, how tall the tree should be, you may not have as much choice here too. And that's really what you run into. You may not be given a choice here. Um, I, when I ordered my peach trees this past spring, one is a whip, one is a feather. That was the only options I really had for both of them when it came to their, their dwarf height. We've mentioned this a little bit before, you know, as you're thinking about planting some of these fruit trees, call Julie, a joint utilities group that's based in Illinois. And when you call this number, you're alerting them that you're going to do some digging. And especially for a standard tree that is going to put down some good solid roots, it's really important to know where those utility lines are. We really don't want you to start doing digging without you really knowing where those utility lines are and causing problems. Um, we'd also still recommend a soil test, though in most cases the soil test will really tell you quite a bit when it comes to what your soil currently is showing, but I think you'll find that a lot of times your soil will be really good. The stone fruit need full sunlight. You know, they really don't thrive in partial light. You really want to consider in an area where they're getting full light, full sunlight. You also want to consider an area that's weed control free and also avoid any areas with water and air drainage, avoiding kind of what we call frost pockets. Some of the sweet tree, sweet cherry tree growers in Wisconsin in Michigan speak highly of putting their sweet cherries up on a hill. And sometimes they find that that can really help when it comes to getting good air circulation. But you really want to avoid any of those frost pockets where things can stay too cold and potentially it could damage some of those very vulnerable buds in spring. Like with other fruit trees, pH about six to seven. The thing with stone fruit that I would encourage you to look at is to think about wind breaks. This group is one that we know is going to have issues with a cold winter. And if you could provide a wind break, you will find much greater success in these trees. This is anecdotally what some of us have observed is that by having some kind of wind break in place, these trees can survive some of those winters that you know we don't always think they're going to. Um, this windbreak could be that the tree is closer to a shed and kind of the shed is providing some wind protection. It could be that you have smaller trees in your area that's surrounding it and near the tree that's providing protection too. I've heard some folks for, especially with these dwarf trees, they've taken hay bales and straw bales and they have put them kind of right near these fruit trees to kind of create a barrier to keep that wind from hitting it, that, especially that winter wind. So this would be something we would recommend. Um, we have found really good success with the peach trees in the Rockford office because they are sandwiched in between two buildings. So they're getting wind protection from two buildings at this point and really helping out quite a bit. And I think honestly, that's why they've really survived, even survived that really, really cold winter we had in 2014. 
It's important to recognize that for any dwarf, semi-dwarf tree, you're going to need to do some staking. You're going to need to support that tree in some way, usually with bamboo or some other kind of metal piece in order to really make sure that that tree has the support that it needs. And this is going to be a staking that um, it has its entire life it's a, if it's a dwarf or a semi-dwarf tree. You see in this image here, you know, kind of that day of, of, of planting the fruit tree. And this is the peach tree that I planted this past spring. And you'll note that even though I believe this is one of my feathered trees that arrived, it came with a really massive root system. And I think that's what you'll find too with a lot of the trees, whether they're whipped or feathered, they're going to have a good root system with them. And you really want to make sure you get as much of that root system into the soil as you can. Um, so it can really start it off and really start off strong. When you're planting this group of stone fruit, you certainly have to recognize that they're going to have pruning needs. And day one, you can get into some pruning, which I'll um, which will give you a resource um, after today that gets into some of this. But you, this group is a different shape than the apples and pears. Apples and pears tend to be a central leader. They tend to work really well as kind of a Christmas tree type shape where you have one central leader branch and then you have these scaffold branches and smaller branches off of the tree that are producing the fruit. For the stone fruit group, they do well in what we call a fruit bowl, open beige shape, which you see in this image here, where it's allowing for good air movement, it's allowing for better pollination. And it's one that if you were planting in this next season, or if you have a tree that's maybe a couple of years old, you may find that you could get into this tree kind of fruit bowl open shape. And yet you may have a tree that's much older and you can't do that. Maybe it's already just in a central leader shape. We have a number of fruit trees, peach trees, at uh, the Rockford office that are this way. They're central leader, they're never gonna get to a bowl shape and, and that's very much okay. This group is also one that when we talk about apple and pear pruning, we, we really talk about, okay, try to take out a third of the branches every year, try to prune from mid-December to March 1st. And yet, when we think about pruning stone fruit, if we find, if you are encountering a mild winter, and I would say at this point we have a mild winter, you might hold back on doing as much pruning. And the reason for this is that we may fully be expecting to get some peaches or other stone fruit this season. And you may find that those big cuts or a lot of the pruning that you want to do could wait a year could maybe wait until you realize that you're gonna lose your peach buds for that season. Um, stone fruit and other uh, peach, other buds, they cannot survive negative eight degrees Fahrenheit for an consecutive days. So if we have encountered a winter where there's been negative eight degrees at least, or unfortunately colder than that, and we've had that for consecutive days, you should fully expect that you're not going to have stone fruit that season. And if you expect that you're not going to have it, maybe that's the winter then that you decide to do more pruning compared to a winter this year where we've not been in the negatives just yet. So this would be a winter where maybe you don't do as much pruning. So balancing it out, that's kind of what I'm getting at. You know, if, if it feels like it's going to get really cold or you think it's cold, or if you have found that it's still mild, maybe next year is when you do more extensive pruning. So when thinking about this shape, you know, what I've tried to do in this drawing here is to kind of show you what that previous photo really was showing. You know, you've got this central leader trunk, which is in green here, and it's a single trunk that's going about 18 to 30 inches high. This depends quite a bit on if it's a dwarf or semi-dwarf tree. So as you can imagine, probably a dwarf and semi-dwarf is going to be into that 18 inches. Compare that to maybe a standard tree where you might be getting up to 30 inches, 36 inches. And off of that, you're going to have scaffold branches in the blue, which you see here. And these scaffold branches are where your fruit is going to be produced uh, for this stone fruit group. You want to almost think about that none of that it's kind of a compass like design. So each branch is kind of going in a different direction and a different uh, geographical direction too. You also want to avoid any branches that are facing southwest. This is just due to uh, sunlight issues later in the season where it might be blocking out 
the light from getting to other parts of your tree. You also want to consider kind of these crotch angles, how the tree branches are fitting together, kind of about 40, 40 degrees is what you're after. Um, and a lot of the pruning that you would potentially be doing in the wintertime would be in the red. So you see here, it's a branch that's growing straight down that's not serving you much purpose, or it's a branch growing completely up from where the main trunk of, of that tree is. It could also be smaller little branches within those scaffold branches that you see here in the red and blue. And some of it's maybe just shaping the tree up. You know, if you find that you have good scaffolds that are open up, you might then be able to kind of prune them back or create more of a direction for them too. Um, if we thought more of a central leader, this would be a very different, different setup then. So you can see in this drawing kind of this open center pruning where, you know, a first year spring. So say this tree has been planted in 2020. It now is going into the spring of 2021. Um, before, you know, I get into that, I would have done winter pruning. And you can see that first year would be what I would be doing. So I might be doing a heading cut to begin to maybe create and form kind of that open center shape. This is a 2G, 2D drawing. So of course it doesn't really show kind of that compass like direction with our branches. By the second year, you're gonna see like every little red mark is where an additional cut would be made. And some of it is because it's going into the tree, into that center. And we really wanna keep this, these branches as open as we can, uh, as possible. We really want those scaffolds to be much open. And by that third year, you still see we've got those kind of scaffold branches in place where the fruit is being produced. And now we're cutting off limbs that maybe are just not serving much purpose. They're growing into the tree, they're competing against one another, but at the end of the day, really thinking about that open, open bowl shape. Sometimes what I do when I think about, you know, pruning for an open bowl or a vase is I think about my hand and I think about each finger representing a scaffold branch and my, um, my arm almost acting like a central leader. And in thinking of that shape, seeing in how that might be able to look like my peach tree or my stone fruit rather. The photo you see here is showing you where the actual fruit is, where the actual buds are on your stone fruit. And this would be very important for you to kind of be mindful of looking for is to actually where that stone fruit is and where it's going to develop. So you see, you know, as you think about the stone fruit that has a little bit of two leaves on either side and the fruit is in the middle of that. Higher up, you can actually see a leaf bud. So you can see the leaf bud directly all the way up that does not have that same shape. And that will never produce fruit, but it is that you want to have leaves, of course, on your tree. Um, so to kind of play around with this a little bit and show you some examples, you see here on the left, and the right, these are both peach trees, and I've tried to color code them in to give you some idea of, you know, where the scaffold branches might be, where that central leader is in the green, and then you can see kind of smaller branches in the red. Because this was just planted this past spring, and now we're talking about a full season into next spring of just central growth, um, I've got opportunities here where I might do some extensive pruning, or I may give it a little bit more time, knowing full well that it's just one season, just one winter it's gone through, and I'm maybe expecting to get peaches this season. Because of this tree though, and because of its age, um, I would probably not be doing a lot of pruning with it. You know, if I was to do a lot of pruning, I might just be removing one limb here in year one, maybe another limb in year two, it really depends on the situation. So it's kind of a balanced approach, you know, and I'm still hesitant and still kind of thinking about this weather to determine whether or not I'm going to do a lot of pruning this season. This dwarf tree was actually pruned by uh, a deer this past October. And so this is one where I'm not going to actually be doing any pruning this season. Uh, the deer damage caused some damage and has pruned it already effectively for me. Um, but you can already see in the shape, I, I tend to have some really good three scaffolds already. And it's something that I will try to encourage as the seasons come to really keep kind of that open center shape for, for this tree to hopefully really thrive. This is one of our peach trees in the Rockford office. This is now, I think it's 
we're going to enter into its third season of doing more pruning on this tree, a tree that really hadn't been pruned uh, for a couple of seasons. So you note we've got a lot of scaffolds on the left and a lot of them are cutting into one another and will be pruned out. There's a lot of branches that are growing straight down to the ground. And we also see the scaffolds in the blue on the left side. There's one that's just too close to the ground that will need to be pruned too. Um, you also kind of see that it is a bit of a central leader structure in shape, and yet it's one that may be very hard to get to just a single central leader. You almost see I've got almost four central leaders in this photo here with this tree that potentially I might be able to remove one or two every year, or I may not be able to do it whatsoever. It just really depends. This tree did not produce fruit this past season. It produced fruit the, the previous year in 2019. So it's one where right now things look good. I need to prune it, but I may not be doing as much pruning. So yes, that's just a quick little introduction to the pruning. We've got a lot more classes and, and webinars that have been recorded that get more into the pruning process. Um, but just to kind of share kind of what you're looking at when it comes to this stone fruit group that can be a little bit different. So let's talk about some diseases, some of which can be fairly cosmetic or they can be some that can be heavily destructive for this group. The photo that you see here is for brown rot and scab. So brown rot is in the foreground. You kind of see that kind of brownish coloration on, on the peach. Um, disease is gonna begin a bloom. It's gonna spread during long wet periods. So certainly wet springs is where we'll see a lot of brown rot occurring. There's also the ability to control and remove infected fruit during the season and then remove dead mummies at the end of the season. This may be something that you currently see is that if you look at your, your stone fruit, you may find these kind of shriveled up peach and stone fruit pods and of the peaches from the previous year. And that can actually be where the infection moves in. Depending on the height, you could go through while you're pruning and remove them and destroy them. And that could potentially help you this upcoming spring. Once snow is off the ground the spring, you might still come through and remove some of those infected fruit that has dropped the previous season that you didn't get to uh, during your winter pruning. Scab overwinters from previous season. Uh, this, this front photo here, you kind of see kind of a, uh, the lighter coloration of the scab. It's very common the first year of growth. You may find that for a couple of seasons, you don't have it. One of the ways to really help with scab is good pruning practices. So pruning things effectively, having good airflow. You may find some preventive fungicides available to apply, and yet you may find that the easiest thing for you to do um, is to actually just practice really good pruning practices and making sure there's good airflow for this group of, um, of stone fruit. Cherry leaf spot is a really common one that we see a lot on cherry trees. We can also see it on other stone fruit. And I think if you've grown cherries before, you've probably seen this one pretty regularly. One of the main issues with this one is that it can cause full defoliation in summer. So while you may have gotten a cherry crop that season, you may find that all the leaves have been infected and all the leaves have dropped maybe midway through that season. And this could then prevent next year's cherry crop from growing really well for you uh, with it. It's also one that overwinters on dropped leaves. So you know, if you've had any leaf drops this season into the fall, removing them before the wet spring would be the best practice that we would recommend that you do, um, as well as just kind of be mindful of those wet conditions. There are some fungicides that are available to you when it comes to this one, um, but you may find that you know, it's, it's one that doesn't always work well. I think the main consideration here with the cherry leaf spot is to break the disease cycle. So if you find that you had a lot of leaf drop this past summer and into the fall, you wanna to try to clean and remove those leaves this spring before the disease reappears and reemerges. So try to break the cycle as best you can here. Um, and it may mean that you know the leaf drop you encountered in the summer and the fall will mean that you don't have a cherry crop in 2021. And yet try to break this cycle by removing the leaves that have dropped if you can. 
the bacterial canker is, is pretty common on a lot of the stone fruit trees that we grow. And I think if you have seen kind of any of this, like, let's be honest, gross, go, gross goo uh, coming from your tree trunks, from your limbs, there's a strong chance that it's kind of this bacterial infection. And the infection tends to go towards certain parts of the bark and tends to go for the leaves, for the limbs, and can sometimes go for the trunks of the trees. We see this off and on with some of the stone fruit in Northern Illinois, that it hits hard. Um, it can be really rough for this group. It overwinters in the cracks and it also moves into the trees in very wet conditions. Yet again, in springtime, you might see this. I would say that the best step that you could do is to look this year during pruning and look for any infections that may have overwintered. And then about four inches from where that infection is, you'll probably see a bit of a line. That's where you want to remove. And you want to destroy these branches and limbs. You actually want to remove them. Um, you don't want to try to say, put them in the brush pile nearby because they can move in with infection. You also want to consider cleaning the pruners between cuts with a rubbing alcohol solution. This is a great strategy when it comes to different smaller limbs, ones that can be done with loppers and, and pruners. It may be very difficult, though, if a lot of the bacterial infection is in the main trunk of that tree. And it could be that every year that's where it's coming from. That may be one that's a little bit more difficult to control. And frankly, you may not have much control options when it comes to this one. We see this on cherry. We see it on plums. We also see it quite a bit on peach trees. Uh, all of our three, three or four main big stone fruit get this issue. It's going to depend on the season, of course, and yet the best step would be preventative pruning uh, before the season begins for this one. You may find that you could prune a little bit in the summertime, especially for this infection to keep from spreading, uh, but it's one to very much be on the lookout for. move into insects a bit and of course you know Japanese beetles are one that do not just impact the stone fruit but they impact a lot of others. We get reports that you know the Japanese beetles really like some of those younger stone fruits and certainly it's something to really <laughs> have to have to manage. I know I was having to manage them this this past season on my very young stone fruit trees. You've got a couple of strategies. You know one of the ones you're going to hear a lot about is hand picking early morning, soapy water, kind of flicking them into the water and letting them drown. That can be an easy strategy to do. I recognize that does not work for a very tall tree and sometimes does not work for a lot of fruit trees either. And yet that might be one that might work okay for you. We tend to not recommend the Japanese beetle traps. They tend to attract more than are actually captured. If you had a lot of acreage, you might be able to get away with Japanese beetle traps and yet just know it's always going to attract more than, than what you ever were going to capture. I've seen some folks that have taken a Japanese beetle trap and they have modified it into a bucket of water so that when they fly into the trap, they drop and they drown into that bucket. Uh, usually they're taking a trash can and then they're kind of modifying that entry. Trap cropping can sometimes help with zinnias and marigolds. They tend to maybe go towards them more than others but you need to then control the population building up. There's chemical control with neem oil, spinosin that's organic. Sometimes soil solutions work. Sometimes the issue with putting it into the soil like milky spore is that depending on where you're located in say a neighborhood or a subdivision, it's not going to address the entire Japanese beetle population because you uh, are so close to your neighbors that have a Japanese beetle issue. Uh, some people are recommending doing a handheld vacuum and then drowning them. Um, it will look silly, and yet folks have had some good success with it. Uh, frankly, I have not vacuumed Japanese beetles from my peach trees as of yet, but we'll see how next season goes. This cherry fruit fly infection is, is what you notice in this photo from Michigan State. So flesh is turning brown color through this infection. The uh, brown discoloration usually will also lead to an edible fruit. You may find also too that it's, you know, it's just something that you're not, not really pleased with. Um, the females are piercing the yellow cherry and skin and they're laying eggs into it. And so it's just not, cre not, uh, not, um, not something that you're really going to enjoy too much. 
you could put out a yellow sticky card near bloom time and remove any infested fruit to keep from overwintering would be another thing that we would recommend. Um, you may find that you have so many cherries that this infection is so minor compared to the cherries that you're, you're picking from. In most of the cases too, if you're picking some of these and they have a little bit of the infection, you're still able to cut around it. Um, and you're still able to eat it. There are insecticides that are available um, and they would need to be just timed when it comes to cherry production, whether these could be uh, um, the insecticide we sprayed or not. Pum coculia was one that also impacts apples and pears. This is a weevil, lays eggs into the plums and the cherry fruit uh, as it's developing. You can see the, the adult here and you can also see what the damage looks like. A bit of a scarification uh, is what we really notice with this one. It's a small crescent shaped scar. The larva will then move in. For a lot of the management for this, it would be physical removal. You may find that you could shake the tree with limbs shake the tree limbs with the tarp underneath could help with this. You might also consider picking up and destroying any early drops in May or June. If any of your stone fruit has dropped, consider removing it as that could help with disease, it can also help with insects. There are some insecticides available uh, for this one as well if you find that it becomes a very severe issue. Deer damage is also one that you may notice quite a bit, especially in parts of Joe Davis County where our deer population is, is pretty, uh, pretty big. Uh, we see that and we really recommend having some kind of deer guard in place for this group of fruit trees. Um, I had deer guard in place a little bit and yet I didn't have enough when it came to the damage that the deer did on one of my uh, young peach trees. You also want to consider removing mulch around the base of the tree. This would be for smaller mammals as they tend to really kind of hide from predators in and around that base. Um, look towards soap deterrent, Irish spring kind of hanging up around the neck uh, or rather the limbs of some of your fruit trees would work really well. That smell would kind of keep them away. And then you also want to consider um, kind of a hot pepper spray could also be another thing. We mentioned this some with the apples and pears group. This could also work with stone fruit. You're applying this onto the leaves and potentially this could help deter some of those deer. Um, you do want to make sure that this spray is listed for fruit and vegetable production. There's a number on the market that are not listed for this and you wanna consider it. I'll send you a link today from University of Minnesota. They've actually done some really interesting research with what we call micro enclosures. And that's what you see here. It's these cattle, cattle panels that are about 16 feet by 16 feet. And they can work really well in keeping deer out. There's something about the actual size and the shape of them that tends to um, kind of keep deer away from it. And you may find that in certain areas or backyard orchards that you have, this might be a pretty good strategy. I think one of the things that's beneficial here is that it's a little more cost effective because usually when we recommend deer fencing for fruit trees, it can be very expensive and it doesn't make much sense. And yet the micro enclosures, there've been some reports that this may work really well and they're really easy to get set up too. So I'll send that link for you. When, when, when you look at your fruit this spring, you, and especially if you, you, know, you look outside, everything looks healthy, and then you look at the calendar or the weather and recognize that snow or cold snap is moving in, you might decide to go out and see if there's been much damage. And all of this is going to depend highly on the growth stage of the stone fruit. It's going to depend on the location of your trees. It's going to depend on just so many other environmental factors. When we reach into a period of time where it's 28 degrees Fahrenheit, there's potential for 10% loss of fruit based on the growth stage of, of our stone fruit. If we reach a period of sometimes hours where we're at 24 degrees Fahrenheit, potentially this is 90% loss of fruit. You'll note that both of these, the 28 and the 24, are very similar temperatures for loss on pears and apples. So you will find that if you had a mixture of different fruits in the backyard, look at the stone fruit, also look at apples and pears. And both of them, of course, will have different growth stages that may impact it. One of the things you're looking for is what you see here on the left. So if you see with this cherry bud here, if you came out and after maybe a, a day or two of having you know, 
28 degree uh, temperatures, if you take one of the buds and maybe sacrifice and open it up, you want to actually see kind of where this pistil is, where it should be fully green inside with that pistil there. If there was damage, it would be black, it would be shriveled up. Um, that would be something that you want to look for when it comes to, you know, has the frost severely damaged it, any of the things. This may be okay, you know, you may find that you have too much buds on the trees to begin with and maybe having a 10% loss or a 20, 25% loss can really be helpful here too. Um, just depends, of course. We don't expect 90% loss of fruit to be a good thing. Uh, I had some fruit buds this spring, was fully expecting maybe some first peaches this season, and yet we had a late spring frost snow that came in the end of April and just really um, took them out. Birds is another group that we really want to be mindful of when it comes to their damage on stone fruit. I think especially some of those cherries, some of the especially bush cherries, there is potential that there can be a lot of damage and infestation. Netting is one that we would typically recommend, especially for a bush cherry. And I think that's the benefit of having a dwarf or a semi-dwarf tree is that you may be able to utilize a netting system compared to perhaps a standard tree where you couldn't get away from. Couldn't get, couldn't get it. There is also a chemical repellent, a grape Kool-Aid deterrent where you're mixing unsweetened grape Kool-Aid and you're applying this onto the actual fruit and that acts as a bittering agent. It doesn't poison the birds, but it's a bittering agent that they just don't like. You also have the ability to use sugar water, although frankly, I think sugar water is going to cause much more problems than <laughs> you're really hoping and lots of bugs and other things. Um, I'll send links to handouts for both of the recipes for those chemical repellents. You might also be getting away with scare devices. You could do a combination. I think site selection is going to be one of your main steps here. You know, think about where maybe some of your birds in your growing area are nesting or where they're spending a lot of the time and maybe avoid planting your fruit trees close to them, you know, making them further away. And of course, this group is notorious for tolerating certain actions. And you're going to find that something works in 2020, it doesn't work in 2021. For harvest and storage, you know, there's a couple of ways to look at it. Skin should go from green to potentially a combination of colors, red, orange, purple, depending highly on the type of stone fruit that you're growing. You will also find a bit of a, a softball-like feel, especially in peaches, especially in nectarines and apricots. One of the main tests that you will do is a taste test. That's going to be the best way to determine, are my peaches, are my cherries, are my other ones ready to be harvested? You can pick the fruit by twisting slightly while pulling. You know, this is good because it's not going to do severe kind of damage to that tree. And if it's really ripe, it should detach pretty easily through this kind of twisting, twisting action. Most can be stored at 32 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The issue here is that some will be able to store for a couple of days compared to some that maybe could be stored for a couple of weeks. So that's the first part of today. We're now going to kind of end and wrap up into this kind of uncommon fruits. Um, and I'll introduce them. We'll kind of talk about some of the issues you encounter with them, as well as some recommended cultivars that might work for you. One thing just to mention is that there's not as much research on as other common fruits. You know, I'm able to tell you recommended uh, cherry and plum cultivars to grow. But for some of these, we just don't have a lot of information. We don't know a lot about diseases, insects, and even maybe how varieties and cultivars perform. I think it's also important to recognize the growth characteristics, especially the height of some of them. And you may find that you don't realize that until you actually plant it. The photo you see here is goji. We have a couple of goji berries in the Rockford office. And this plant is getting six to seven feet tall. It has huge thorns on this plant as well that's right near the fruit. Those are two things that really weren't explained to me as we planted the goji plant, that it had very large thorns and very much kind of taking over parts of our garden, becoming invasive, if you will. Goji and aronia are also very tart, so taste testing, if you can, is very crucial. We always suggest maybe try one to two plants before planting many. You know, don't go ahead and order, say, 45 of, of particular ones if you're not sure just yet. 
You may also need a male and a female plant. You may need to have cross-pollination and the company should tell you this. So just be mindful that you are your own researcher, if you will, when it comes to growing some of these uncommon fruits. Cranberries are one that we have that folks like a lot, and especially as you drive into parts of Wisconsin, you see just huge bogs of commercial cranberry production. They really thrive in sandy acidic soils. They really thrive in organic matter. You do not need to put a bog into your growing area. I think that's one of the most common misconceptions, if you will, as folks think, all right, I want to grow them, and yet how do I set up a bog in the backyard? And you don't have to do that. They are a very woody evergreen vine. They're self-pollinating, which is also good. You don't have to get more than one variety. If you are growing on a small scale, we would recommend maybe mulching in winter for protection. As you can kind of see in this photo here with this raised bed system and the cranberry plants in place, you could come through and you could mulch layer them just as you might strawberries um, in winter for protection. You find two recommended varieties, Pilgrim, American Highbush, both of them are, are good. One thing that's not mentioned here is that it can take a couple of years for the cranberry plants to really take off and start yielding consistently for you. It may take maybe three or four years until you get consistent yields. Currants and gooseberries are one that we see a lot of folks that really like. They're hardy, they're very easy to grow, but they still need a good amount of sunlight or they might be able to deal with some kind of a partial shade even here too. Um, you can plant them pretty close together. So you can kind of see that um, currants can go about two to four feet and then gooseberries are about four to five feet. And different colors, different flavors are noticeable here too, such as Red Lake, which is a current one in red. Um, you have uh, Crandall, which is a black. You have lots of different flavors of currants, very, very small fruit with gooseberries as well. Additional varieties are listed here too, the poor man, the welcome, uh, but really thrives. We really see a lot of potential with gooseberries, especially as some of them can have kind of native tendencies, which we like. Saskatoons are also known as a June berry. They're also gonna be known as a service berry. These tend to be a little bit bitter and yet they tend to be best eaten fresh. They tolerate very cold winter conditions. So if you were planting these, you should fully expect that they're gonna survive most winters that we see here in Northern Illinois. Um, so, I mean, they can go all the way up to zone two. We still recommend full sun varieties, full sun recommendation of planting. I think the main challenge we run in here with Saskatoons is that they're very hard to find the varieties. There's very few on the market, they're very hard to find. I think you would still find them at Junk Seeds, Stark Brothers, and some others, but it may very, be very hard to find some of the varieties out there that would produce for you. You see the photo of what these look like. You know, they almost have a look a bit of like blueberries, if you will, and yet have a different flavor, flavor to them. The sea berry is also known as sea buckthorn. It is though a very different buckthorn than the one that is invasive that we do not recommend you grow. Um, it thrives in full sun. This is one they've said it just has a lot of ability to perform in really poor soil conditions. It's also one that also helps your soil. I think that's one of the draws here with sea berry is that it can actually fixate nitrogen to the soil. We've yet to see it go say full scale where you could be planting it for a couple of years and then removing it. We really are just seeing it. You plant the sea berry and it should thrive in really bad soil conditions. One of the other characteristics it has, it has a more of a bush characteristic, but it is one that's gonna get maybe 10 feet tall once it reaches maturity. This is also one that you need a male plant and you need a male plant for every six to eight females. In most cases, when you order from a company, they're, they are wanting you to buy more of the sea berry. So they're going to recommend a male, male type for you as well as the females. The goji berry is also known as wolf berry. Uh, this is the one that you can see in the photo that we have in our Rockford office that we planted, I believe in 2018. Uh, it's high in antioxidants, which is why folks really like this berry. I find that it does need some trellising to keep the plants off the ground. They tend to kind of cascade and fall onto the ground. It's very cold hardy, it's very heat tolerant. It ripens in July. We do recommend a raised bed. 
Um, you know, this is one that there are varieties that grow well, and yet I'm really hesitant to recommend you grow goji berry. The reason for it is that it's covered in thorns, and the thorns make it that while the fruit is good, the fruit is flavorful, it's not a great plant to grow. I'm really hesitant to recommend it um, based on its plant quality. I've also found that it has invasive tendencies and it tends to grow underneath the raised bed that's currently growing in. And I find it's very hard to control. So those are all some things that anecdotally I share with you to be very hesitant with growing goji berry, also known as wolfberry. You can see the plant here on the left here. It's a very big plant kind of taking over this raised bed area. It tends to have very long um, branches that kind of cascade. Yet again, it's all covered in thorns. You can see on the right here, very beautiful purple flower. And as you follow your way down, you can just kind of slightly see some of the thorns that are on the goji berry plant. Um, so certainly know what you're getting yourself into. And of course, when they talk about goji berry and, and recommend you growing it, they don't tell you, you know, hey, it's covered in thorns and it may become invasive as we have really encountered at our Rockford office. Aronia is very similar in its tartness to the goji berry, and yet it has none of those issues when it comes to its plant quality. It's known as chokeberry. You're going to find black and red varieties available to you. It does prefer a bit of a full sun to partial shade, and we also find that it can kind of tolerate different conditions. Um, it does have a suckering habit, meaning that it may have the ability to continue to kind of get bigger uh, over time. And you note that, you know, as, as a spacing wide, you're looking at maybe three to feet wide and maybe grow six to 10 feet between. There's a lot of varieties. There's black ones. You can see also too that presents a very beautiful orange reddish leaf in the fall. I think that's one of the main great qualities about it is its decorative quality along with its fruit. Some of the fruit trees that have been kind of resurfaced the last couple of years is pawpaws. And pawpaws are very big, one of the largest berries. It tends to get about 15 to 20 feet tall, has very large leaves, it grows from multiple trunks. You also are going to need a male and a female. The pawpaw fruit, which you see here in this bottom photo, is what you're after. It has very big seeds, um, seeds within it, but it has a short shelf life of about two to three days. There, it's very creamy texture. Uh, it has a bit of a custard kind of quality to it. Some folks say it has mango banana flavor. We've tried a couple at our offices before and I'm not necessarily the biggest fan. Um, we, uh, and yet you may find some really good things with the quality of it. There's a lot of research at pawpaws right now and a lot of it's come from Kentucky and I'll, I'll send you a link for that information too. Here you can see the actual tree, you know, not pictured in this tree is another tree. You're always going to have a male and a female in order to get your actual pawpaws. But you can see a very different kind of quality in its appearance and its shape. Um, I think it pre presents a really nice kind of decorative um, landscape type of tree to your growing area. And then on the right there is where the actual fruit is. Um, and depending on the fruit and the pollination, you make it a lot um, depending on that year. The haskips are also known as honeyberry. That seems to be a common theme, as you note that a lot of these have very much more than one name. We have some haskip honeyberries at the Rockford office right now. It's a very nice little shrub. It produces really significantly. Uh, I've not had any issues when it comes to its pruning needs or surviving winters. Um, it is a type of honeysuckle, but it doesn't really produce kind of that invasive quality to it. The fruit's really good. It's a really solid kind of yielding fruit to it. The ones that we have have a bit more of a purple tinge to their color. You also need more than one cultivar and you also need them to flower in May and then they're gonna ripen about July and August. This would be one that as you're exploring different smaller fruits out there, you might consider this one. This is one that just has a nice kind of plant quality to it as well as flavor and pretty easy. I think that's one of the nice benefits is we haven't really had to do a lot with the soil or really do a lot of pruning and yet it yields pretty, pretty well and consistently every season. 
Um, so you see here from University of Wisconsin, this is a much bigger type of cultivar. So it is a little bit more bigger than some of the other smaller ones that you encounter. And as you looked, if it, once it flowers and starts to develop fruit, you would see these smaller fruits off of the branches. Um, but very good quality would be one that we would probably would recommend if you're looking to go beyond some of those traditional, traditional fruits. Elderberry is one we get a lot of questions about, um, and especially for kind of cultivated elderberries, you'll see American varieties that work really well, lots of heavy fruit production. You also find European ones that are a little bit similar, but they're going to be much taller in their height. So you may expect a European type, such as Madonna, to get maybe um, 10 to 10 plus in height. Perhaps you're getting about 14 to 16 feet in height compared to the Adams or the York, which is probably gonna stay about six to 10 feet in its height. Um, you do need full sun, but they're gonna be tolerating a lot of different conditions there too. Hardy Kiwi is one that one of our other educators has actually grown in his backyard area. It does need a male and a female, uh, but he recommends it highly. It has vining characteristics, and he says he's expecting about 100 pounds of very, very tiny kiwi. And yes, 100 pounds from a single plant. Uh, seems like a, quite a lot uh, from it. The Isa Hardy is the one that he's currently growing, and it's a self-pollinating type. Um, they can yield significantly once established, but you may need some winter protection from it. So that's just one to consider. You see it here at the side. You know, it looks like traditional kiwi. It grows kiwi in northern Illinois. Uh, so one to look at this hardy kiwi. Uh, quinces, 10 to 20 feet tall, depending on the variety. They are self-fertile, so they're going to yield with just one of them. You will find orange quince, you will find Russian quince. Um, there's also some very smaller ones. And the fruit you can kind of see here is a little bit similar to, to apples, a much different flavor. The only caution here is they are very fire blight prone to that disease. Uh, about a figs, productive, easy to grow. Uh, I currently have figs that I'm growing. I have a fig in a container and have, have always had it as an indoor fig tree, but they can also be grown outside. You could grow them in a container, grow them outside in the summer, and then move them back into the winter um, indoors. They tend to ripen in July. They could also ripen through that frost too, but very easy, very productive. One of the benefits here is that you do not need to do any pollination. So they're gonna produce the figs without you having to hand pollinate and without you having to put in another cultivar. You can see the photo of the fig here. This is my fig tree I have in my living room, which I like that I can say that I harvest figs from my living room. That could be something that you, you take pride in perhaps too. They need full sun. And the two varieties that are recommended are Chicago Hardy, as well as the brown turkey varieties. But very consistent in yields. The fruit's a little bit smaller than you might be expecting. That's the only drawback here. Persimmons, these are ones that you could grow, but know that most are going to get 50 feet tall once they start to reach maturity. You also need a female and a male tree, maybe needed. Um, there is a shorter variety of a meter American persimmon. And you should also expect maybe every three to four years is when they actually start to fruit is when they would reach maturity. You'll harvest during the fall after a number of light frosts in the area. They could work well, but just know that you might have chosen one that's gonna get really tall. I'm gonna end a little bit on nuts. Almonds, almond trees would be the one that I might recommend you try out if you've gotten really comfortable with growing stone fruit. Because it's in that same family, you can expect to find very similar issues and diseases and so forth. And yet there are some almond trees that are just reaching 15 to 20 feet tall. Most of what we would recommend is actually Ukrainian type of almonds. Um, you do want more than one variety. They are gonna bear around three years and yet you're gonna find some potential almond varieties on the market to plant in the backyard. So when we compare these to other nuts, these may be ones that are more consistent in yields. And yet we don't see a lot of almond, almond production, even though it could work for you. Pecans could also work. The only issue is that you're looking at 10 to 15 years to get your kind of first kind of grouping of pecans. There are very tall varieties and I would not recommend them, of course, at 75, 100 feet. There's also ones that um, need more than one variety for cross-pollination. 
Kobe, Missouri Mammoth, Missouri Hardy, all of those could work, but you may find that um, it's just gonna take some years to get there. Chestnuts were also another one that could do well for you. You wanna look for ones that have some resistance to the chestnut blight. Um, but yet again, five to seven years is when we expect kind of this group to start yielding for you. And you would harvest into September. Like some of the others, they need another variety for cross-pollination. You can see the chestnut there itself, the actual meads. So you can see it's a very different kind of, uh, it's kind of chestnut, it's um, nut, if you will. The last one we're talking about today is going to be hazelnuts. This is known as filbert, but we see a lot of folks that are looking at hazelnuts as a potential nut to grow that does pretty well. Um, they grow as a large shrub, so you compare that to some of our other nut trees that are significantly tall. They're also ones that really thrive in most of the soil conditions in northern Illinois. Um, the one thing to consider is that you're going to need to do some kind of drying period before consuming. But you may find that this is something to kind of play around with and experiment with. There's a lot of European varieties that are bigger than Americans, but then there's also an American European cross that is, that's kind of in the middle group. So it does pretty well in addressing some of the plant qualities that you need, as well as getting those yields you're expecting. Um, Theta, Jefferson, Royal, Barcelona, Finger Lakes, those are all really good ones that could work really well. And you want to kind of match these trees up together with when it comes to kind of making sure they're getting proper cross pollination. They do have pruning needs, similar to pruning any other shrub is what you're going to encounter with, with the hazelnuts. And certainly if you had acreage, it might be where hazelnuts fit in really well compared to say putting out one hazelnut in the backyard. So we're getting wrapped up today. I know we've got some questions that I want to get answered you know, as we get, uh, as we end today's session. I'll send out a number of resources your way, whether it's growing stone fruit in the home gardens, lots of good things from Wisconsin on currants, gooseberries, and elderberries. I also find there's a lot of great resources on hardy kiwi and pawpaw and other ones too. So I'll send resources your way when it comes to the ones that are listed here. So begin putting in some questions in the chat box if you've got them. I know we do have some time today. One of the things to consider as we get wrapped up today is I think with both the stone fruit and some of those unusual uncommon ones, just recognize that there's gonna be limitations with growing them. There's gonna be years that are wonderful where you get some of the best fruit you've ever had. And there's gonna be some years where it just doesn't happen. Um, this is just what you encounter when it comes to growing stone fruit. Expect some challenges, expect some challenges with our planting zone that are out of your control. When, when, it comes, when it comes down to it. And expect the good years and bad years. The photo you see here is peaches from 2019 at the Rockford office. And I have no peaches from 2020 photos to share you. We're hoping for peaches in 2021 to show, and yet we still have some time to think about it. Consider the right cultivars that are recommended and also consider that height. Be very mindful of that standard tree, especially as we think of what we need to do to keep some disease in control, insects in control, and hopefully maybe get some birds away from it too. If you're growing any of those uncommon fruits, you're on your own. I, I kid here, I'm, I'm kidding here, but certainly know that we really depend on you to tell us what, how things work. And especially with some of these that we just don't have the research on. What I told you today about goji berry and honey berry is coming from my own experience. And we certainly value the experience of you all when it comes to growing some of these uncommon fruits that we just don't have the research on. And finally, enjoy the fruits. I hope that what I've shared with you today has not scared you out of growing the stone fruits or any of the uncommon fruits, but at least has put you on the path to determining what to grow, how to grow it, and hopefully get the yields that we're really after. So I'm gonna turn my video on and take a water, a sip of water. Um, that's my email and my phone number if you have any additional questions. You'll get an additional email probably tomorrow or Monday with all the resources we talked about today um, to kind of guide you in this next thing. Uh, our series will continue next week with grapes. I believe it's grapes, I need to check. And then we'll of course have strawberries to come too. So let me look at the questions.
All right, someone shared that Red Haven is a late bloomer as well. So that's great. Thanks for sharing that because we're always thinking of kind of those late blooming, blooming fruit trees to kind of get out of that window uh, of uh, well, we, we don't want when it comes to those late dwarfs. There was a question about why do dwarf semi-dwarf trees need lifelong staking? Because of the, the rootstock that they're on, the rootstock and the height can really not always support all of that fruit that will be developing. And even though a dwarf semi-dwarf is say going to produce maybe 50% of how much we would expect a standard tree pr to produce, we still find that the weight of that fruit is really, um, even with fennin, even with pruning, is putting too much on that tree. So that's why we always kind of recommend the staking. I think there's also some thought that those first couple of years where maybe there's not a lot of fruit that is developing, would be beneficial by being in a staking system to just kind of help them out. Uh, there was a question about pruning now. Yes, so you could certainly prune any of the stone fruit from mid-December to about March 1st is what we recommend. Um, we really don't recommend going beyond March 1st, but it could still be cold. It still could be some snow on the ground and you might be able to get away with it looking at it, but certainly not any big cuts. Look for you know, doing the pruning now if you could. Uh, there was a statement several years ago, I, I had a plum tree that dropped all its fruit every year before they fully ripen. I pruned the tree regular and saw no other problems with it except the Japanese beetles swarmed daily. After about five years, I cut it down so it wasn't worth keeping. Any ideas why it wouldn't keep its fruit? You know, it's an interesting question, you know, with, with fruit that just keeps dropping with it. You may have gotten to kind of biennial fruiting period, perhaps, maybe you know, the tree was kind of being thrown off and perhaps some years, years it was producing a lot and then next couple of years it wasn't. You know, it may have also been that even though you were pruning, maybe you needed to thin. Maybe you needed to thin it much further uh, than what it was. If it was actually getting to that fruiting stage, it doesn't sound to me like there was a, maybe a soil, there wasn't a soil issue. It doesn't sound to me like there were maybe any other maybe environmental issues occurring. It could be that you maybe needed to thin it a little bit more or maybe something internally was going on with that tree. How to prevent peach tree borer? Yeah, this is one that's really hard to do, Steve. Um, there's a couple of you know insecticides that are out there. I'm unaware of any traps that would help with the peach tree borer. Um, it is one where I would try to also make sure that you're cleaning up any debris just to kind of keep it. Um, as debris free as possible to keep the peach tree borer from getting there. But certainly with that name borer, once it gets in, it gets in. Um, so there's going to be some prevention steps, keeping the area debris clean. Um, I'm unaware of traps. I think there's some insecticides. I don't think a barrier would work. Um, it could be something to maybe play around and experiment with. Perhaps something like a very loose tarp could be placed around that tree trunk. Um, I want to check in on something and I'll send some resources though, just to see what the newest recommendations are. How about peach leaf curl? So the question about peach leaf curl, this is something that's really hard to prevent. Um, uh, there's going to be some fungicides that could potentially address it. I would also clean up any debris from underneath that tree. But as far as like a complete solution, you're going to really think about keeping that area with good airflow. And so that would be something to really focus on is making sure there's good airflow, but certainly recognize that it's a very wet spring that can only do so much. But remove any leaves from overwintering, have good airflow, um, continue to keep that area as weed free as you can too. How big do pawpaw trees normally get? For some of the newest ones, they're getting, I believe, close to 16 to 20 feet. And you kind of saw in that photo there too of a pretty big tree. We're really not talking about that tree, say, being eight to 10 feet or maybe 14 to 16 feet. I think you're really gonna find that's gonna lean heavier on a 16 to 20 foot tall tree. But there's a lots, lots of new varieties on the market uh, through a lot of Kentucky and stuff. Question, um, growing up in a peach orchard, there was nothing closer to heaven than bite into a fully ripe peach you just picked from the tree. You forget about all the, yes. Yeah, it's a great point, Judith. I think that what you really find is that the stone fruit flavor 
is worth all the work, work all, worth all the effort. And it's those good years where you have it that we encourage you to try it out. So, any additional questions as we get wrapped up today? All right, so next week we'll continue our Fruit on Friday series. I will send you some resources um, for some of the questions that you had. I just want to double check on some of them um, uh, as, as we try to answer it. Um, and have a good weekend and uh, hope that you're ready to have some stone fruit this season. At least that's what I'm hoping. So take care. <laughs>